and welcome to step two of discovery. Today is all about who we are as a church and just a little bit more about Paul and myself. We are the lead pastors here at Hope Church. Paul has his master's degree in theology and he really is a great communicator of God's words. We're very blessed to have someone like him at Hope Church. <laughs> and at at his heart, he really is a church planter yep. and a Bible teacher. And then I studied marketing and I just absolutely love to see the local church grow from strength to strength and flourish. Paul and I preached a great message in 2020 that we called Called. <laughs> And it's all about how God called us to be missionaries for 10 years in rural Zambia and then called us to relaunch Hope Church here in George. Yeah. So if you go onto our YouTube channel, Hope Church George, and subscribe, look out for a message called Called that we preached together in 2020 and that will really absolutely help you to understand our hearts and why we do everything that we do yeah. in 2012 god called us from zambia to george and at that time the work we were involved with is in zambia under hope church manga there and the zambia project uh, it was just really flourishing. It's like it's grown. So many people got involved and it really was a significant work. And then when God called us to George, it somehow felt to me like we got demoted. <laughs> um, people would say things to me like, oh, you in a small town now, in a small church. And I'd be like, no, don't you agree with me? George is a city. And although our church only had 50 people in, at the start, I always knew that our church would grow because God says, I will build my church. Then the night before we, we actually had our first service or introduction at Hope Church George, God spoke to me. And you know, when God speaks, it changes everything. We were sleeping, our whole family, our boys were still little. And I woke up. At about three o'clock in the morning, just suddenly wide awake. And I thought to myself, why did I wake up? Is Paul snoring? Again. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all quiet. He wasn't snoring. Then I thought, well, maybe one of the kids are coughing. Uh, maybe I should listen out for that. And it was dead quiet. They were, they were just fast asleep. Then I thought, maybe there's a dripping tap or something. But it was dead quiet. Then in that moment of complete silence and me listening, I heard God speak. It was not an audible voice, but it was a spontaneous thought from nowhere. Yeah. And God said to me, prepare the nets for a great catch. I was like, oh my word, this is so exciting. And I woke Paul up and I said, God just spoke to us. He said, yeah. prepare the nets for, for a, a great, great catch. catch. And what is the nets? To us, the nets are the small groups of our church. So small groups are the heart of Hope Church. And we have seen our church grow significantly the past few years. We've grown from 50 to over 2,000 people on a Sunday. Incredible. It's been an incredible experience so far, to seeing God's favor and to seeing so many lost people come to Christ, seeing the church grow and flourish. Mm. But when we felt God call us to, to George, there were some very specific things that we felt he wanted us to come and do. One of them was to actually reach people in Southern Cape, reach people that were far from God and help them by building a life-giving church. And that's exactly what we've been able to do. Just seeing so many hundreds of people come to Christ, their lives being transformed, their families being impacted, and it's been inspiring and encouraging to us as we've been trying to follow God and build a church that honors him. The other thing that we felt God very specifically tell us to do was that he wanted us to, to give people purpose, to give people purpose. And we, as a church, it's one of the things we absolutely love doing. Is we want to make sure that we help people find their purpose, find the reason why God made them. 
And part of this journey that you're on now called Discovery is about discovering what God made you to do so that we can get you onto a team where you can actually fulfill your purpose and see God's kingdom extended using the gifts and abilities that you actually have. The other thing that we felt God wanted us to do was to build a church that would be financially strong. A church that would actually be able to support the work up in Western Zambia. And by God's grace, that's exactly what our church has become. It's a financially strong church that is actually able to be generous, not just to the work up in Zambia, but to so many other churches in and around our country. And then lastly, the fifth, what we felt God very really specifically wants us to do when he called us back from Zambia to South Africa, was that we wanted us to build a church that would be an inspiration to other church planters and to, um, to somehow play a role yeah. to be inspire other churches uh, to grow and to reach their communities. And by God's grace, uh, through ARC, the Association of Related Churches, which we actually run from George, which is a church planting movement, we're actually able to do that. And it's been so, so, so incredible. You will hear us talk a lot about Zambia. You will actually often hear us say, we have three children, Seth, Nathan, and Zambia. Yeah. We can't encourage you enough. Go onto our website and find out exactly what's happening in Zambia under Hope Church there. Yeah, our website address is www.thezambiaproject.org. And this is what you get to be a part of. Yeah. You know, the Great Commission where God says, go into all the world and make disciples of all people is not an option to consider for a few believers. It's a command to obey for all of us. Yeah. But you can relax. Whew. If you're part of Hope Church, you are also part of the Great Commission yes. because we pray, we, we sow, you can give financially, or you can go up um, and, and serve there in Zambia. We take teams up every year, so please find out more and get more involved. But one of the things that I am extremely passionate about is church growth and to be a biblical church. So I love to look in the Word of God how the early church grew. And it's all recorded in the book of Acts. And Acts 1 verse 15, we see that there were about 120 believers. And this was in the upper room prior to Pentecost. Pentecost was the day the church officially began. It was an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. And I'd encourage you to go and read all about it. Very exciting. Then in Acts 2 verse 41, uh, we see there now are three thousand believers and this is on the day of Pentecost basically the first day of the church 3,000 that's a lot of people then in Acts 2 verse 47 we see that new believers joined them daily Acts 4 verse 4 we see that there are now 5,000 men so still include women and children that is definitely over 15,000 people yeah. Then in Acts 5 verse 28, it says, the critics started saying, you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings. <laughs> Jerusalem was about 200,000 to 250,000 people. So it was quite a big city. It was very similar to George's population. And at that time, after 20 years, in 20 years time, the church grew so strong there were a hundred thousand people in the church. Isn't that incredible? It's huge. It's amazing. So that's half the size of Jerusalem. No wonder the critics were saying, you have filled oh. this place with your teachings. That's our heart. We want everyone to know about our church. Then in Acts 6 verse 7, it says, the number of disciples increased rapidly. Um, in Acts 21 verse 20, it says, there were now tens of of thousands of believers that's a lot of people the original greek word used here is actually murius which means it's a number so large it cannot be counted so yes this church this early church grew rapidly and that's our heart here at hope church church growth is urgent because lost people matter to god God does not want anyone to go to hell, but he wants every single person to spend eternity in heaven. And that's our heart. You know, heaven and hell are not metaphors. They are real 
places. Yeah. And for us, we exist not for those who are already part of our church, but for those who are not yet a part of it. Recent statistics actually show that the world's mortality rate is 100%. <laughs> We all are going to die, die and we need to know where we are going to spend our eternities. Absolutely. I love, I love the story of the church growth in the book of Acts because what it tells us right from the very beginning, 3,000 people, then 5,000 men, just men. I mean, they're all together about 50,000, over 100,000 people. And if you look at all that, what you realize is very important, a very, very important fact is that God's intention is never that the church be small yeah. and insignificant. God's plan always for the church is that it grows, that yeah. it spreads, and that actually changes yes. society. And so we really want to be a biblical church. That means we have to be a growing vibrant strong church and that's how we make a bigger impact absolutely that's how we bring glory to god mm. and um but sometimes you know throughout life you come across different understandings we've been around church and in christianity and serving god full-time ministry for a long time and and every now and again people say yeah but paul do we really have to be a part of a church you know can't we just be part of you know if i'm just a christian am i not part of the church well the interesting thing is that when you actually look at the biblical word church mm. Uh, the word actually that we have in our English Bible. If we had to translate the word church into an English word, it would an, an English word that we'd understand, um, the original Greek word is the word ecclesia, it means the word gathering or assembly. Gathering or assembly. And that means you have to gather. So in order for you to be a part of the church, you have to be part of the gathering. If you're not part of the gathering, you're not part of the church. And so the original word actually comes from this concept where citizens of a particular city, they would actually come and they would be gathered together for special meetings or for special purposes. So when the citizens of a particular city gathered together, when they actually came together, those citizens, that particular gathering was called the church. So it's not whether or not a person was a citizen or not, is when they actually gathered yeah. together, that's when they were part of the church. And so you can't be part of the church if you're not part of the gathering. As a matter of fact, when you actually look at the word church throughout the New Testament, almost every single time that it's used, it's directly referring to a specific local gathering. And so I would encourage you, and I want to, actually what you're doing right now with actually being, you know, taking your next step and actually becoming part of our church through doing discovery, well done. Because yeah. what you're doing is you're actually joining and becoming part of a church. But a church isn't just two or three people meeting together mm -hmm. in, the name of, in the name of Jesus. The yeah. Bible actually gives great detail into the operation, the function, leadership structures of what a church is actually supposed to be, what a biblical church is actually supposed to be. There's, there's a lot of descriptors there. And so we obviously we want to make sure that our church is a biblical church that honors God. And so one of the things that a church has to do, is, or is, is like I've mentioned before, it's it's the citizens, the citizens that gather together. And so for us as a church, that means those that are redeemed that are citizens of heaven. It's when the citizens of heaven gather together. So it's not just anybody that gathers as a Christian or anybody that gathers in the name of Jesus, but those that have genuinely given their lives to the Lord and actually citizens of heaven, the gathering of the redeemed. Another thing that the Bible actually, and, and so the Bible talks about that. It talks about the gathering and when we gather, we actually become, the Bible uses different analogies. One is like that we're a body, that we all have different parts, and we all have different functions. And when we gather together, the finger joins to the arm, joins to the eye, joins to the toe, then the body becomes functioning. And so you have gifts and abilities. You, and, that, and when you, we gather and you bring those together, then the body, the church, can be a functioning the way that God intends it. The Bible also describes the church as an army. It also describes the church as a bride. And it also describes the church as a family. And so we want to be a bride, a beautiful bride that's ready for Jesus. And we also want to be an army, the army of God. And we also certainly want to be a family. The Bible also says that, that in order for a church to be a church, it has to have biblical leadership. And the Bible goes into great detail about what those leaders are supposed to do, how they're supposed to function, and the qualifications of leaders in the church. And the main responsibilities of the leaders in the church are to preach and to teach the word, to set standards, to say this is right and that is wrong, and to make sure that, that biblical discipline and vision and direction are actually fulfilled. In other words, the church is actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is to change the world for Jesus. 
then the church is also a place where we gather our tithes, where we bring our finances to, and we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. Um, communion, where we actually come and we celebrate communion, which is something we do as a church often, both in our large, group, large gatherings as well as in our small gatherings. Uh, a church where there is service, where you're coming and you're participating. So you're not just coming to, to listen and to enjoy worship, but you're, bringing your, you're coming to serve God. And that service is gift oriented service. Like what we said, you know, you might be a finger or a toe. We want to make sure that you're the best finger or the best toe or the best <laughs> eye you can possibly. So gift oriented service, where you're coming to serve, to gather and to serve, to see God's kingdom move forward in a gift oriented way. The Bible also says that there must be preaching. The preaching of the word. The Bible actually gives great descriptions about the importance of preaching and proclaiming what is right, what is wrong, and how does God actually want us to do. Faithful preaching from the Word of God. And then lastly, the Bible says that the gathering happened both in large groups and in small groups. And so we absolutely want to be a biblical church. We gather in large groups on our Sunday services, but we also gather in small groups during the week in people's homes. So exciting. We really are a family and we have no doubt that you belong here and together we get to make a significant difference. Our church is not built on the gifts of one or two people, but on the sacrifices of many. That's so true. There's a story in the book of John where Jesus raised a dead man called Lazarus from the dead. He raised him from death to life. It's an amazing story. It's a miracle. It's incredible. And... I'm just going to read some of these verses to you from John 11, verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Then in verse 39, Jesus says, Take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come oh. out! <laughs> Verse 44. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. What a miracle! We serve the God of the impossible. Lazarus represents people who are dead in their sin, people who are lost, people who have not yet received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And the stone represents anything that is an obstacle for people to come and receive Jesus. Here at Hope Church, we say that we remove stones. We try and prevent doing things that could stand in the way of people receiving Jesus yeah. as their Lord and Savior. We remove stones. We try and make it easy for people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, the gospel is already offensive in a way because we're telling people that they need to lay down their lives and surrender and follow Jesus, take up the cross daily. So yeah, at Hope Church, with everything that we do, we have lost people in our minds. That's why we have balloons and red chairs and coffee because we want you to be able to invite your friends and your family to a place where they can come to and feel completely at home and not be confused or think things aren't making sense. A while ago, I was speaking to an elderly couple uh, in our church yeah. and they were telling me that they really like Paul and I and I hope you also like Paul and I. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they said they didn't enjoy the style of our church. They prefer um, maybe something more traditional where we sang different songs and where things were just done differently. I listened to them and I said, um, you know, I love hearing from you and 
I just want to know, do you have grandchildren? And they said, yes, they have a grandson who lives overseas. And I asked them if their grandson served Christ. And they said, no, he doesn't serve Jesus and he doesn't go to church. So the next question I asked them was that if their grandson was to visit them, would he come to Hope Church with them? And they both looked at each other and said, of course he'll come to Hope Church. He will love this church. <laughs> And I said, we get your point. I said, exactly. That is why we do what we do. We make it easier for people to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We take away stones. Then what happens next? Um, Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So now there, Lazarus came out. He's standing there. But he's now full of grave clothes. So it's very interesting to note that Jesus said to his disciples, take off his grave clothes. He didn't say that to Lazarus. Obviously, Lazarus had a responsibility to let the disciples and Jesus take off his grave clothes. But it was an instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. The same with the instruction that he gave to move the stone away. He said, now take the grave clothes off. What is grave clothes? <laughs> Such a good question. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Grave clothes is anything that holds a person back from living their best life in Jesus Christ. You see, Lazarus was still bound by his grave clothes. And you and I, when we get saved, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we come out the tomb and we, we are set free, but we, we often still have grave clothes on. Yeah. But it's not necessary to walk around with grave clothes because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And grave clothes is anything like sin, unforgiveness, insecurities, bad attitudes. <laughs> when, when I became a Christian, oh my word, I had so many grave clothes. I, uh, I um, sweared a lot. <laughs> what? <laughs> there was one specific word. I don't know. I just kept saying... I really was fearful. I was a fearful person. I was an anxious um, person. I had so many insecurities and addictions and uh, actually all sorts of stuff. I was full of grave clothes. But the moment I became a Christian, I realized that I needed to be in a small group. And it was my small group that helped me take off all these grave clothes. Yeah. We were meant to do life together. God created us for community. And, you know, even if you've been a Christian for, for a long time, you can get grave clothes on again, especially in yeah. isolation, because Definitely. it's not good to be alone. But when we are around other believers, they can speak encouragement into our hearts and speak life into our hearts. But when we're alone, we're so vulnerable to negativity and believing every lie. So please get into a small group because it's at small group where you will find freedom, where we will help you remove your grave clothes. And you know what? Once you find freedom, then you have a responsibility. God instructs us to now take other people's grave clothes yeah. off, then start a small group. But we are so excited about your journey and we want you to know small groups are the heart of Hope Church and our desire is for every single person who calls Hope Church home to be part of a small group. Absolutely. If you, if I look back on my life, you know, same, it's very similar to Marinette, you know, came to church, um, the, initially the church that I, that I went to, it, it, there was a massive stone. It was difficult for people to, that were outside to come into the church. Mm -hmm. It felt like you were an outsider. Yeah. Um, and you had to know all these different things, but nobody explained what those things were. Um, and so it was very, the church certainly was not orientated towards, or towards people that were far from God. Um, but somehow we were able to, to, yeah. to get into church and figure things out for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, as, as, as I was in the church, I still had a lot of major anger issues and major, major um, just insecurities and, and all sorts of grave clothes that were there. And 
No, that's the role of the church. The role of the church is to make sure that we remove obstacles mm-hmm. to make it easy for people to hear the message of Jesus, to hear messages, yeah. the message of Jesus calling them out of the tomb. And yeah. then when people do come out of the tomb and do come into this new life that God's got for them, then somebody's got to come and help them take yeah. their grave clothes off. And that happens in community. One of the statements, little axioms that we love to use here is that healing comes from our community. Mm-hmm. Healing comes from our small group. And so that's why small groups are so, so important, because that's when we help each other actually start to live the life that God's called us to live. And if, you, if, you've been, if you're already a mature believer, or maybe you've, you're actually already living in, in freedom, please help somebody else. Get into a small group and help other people discover freedom. We really need each other. Well, here at Hope Church, we have a vision, and we love our vision. Our vision is to build a dynamic church, I love the word dynamic, yeah. of tens of thousands of people, a church that starts other life-giving churches and brings hope to a lost and broken world. So we have started Hope Church Wilderness Heights, which is in the informal settlement in Wilderness Heights. We call this church a community church, and we're also in the process of starting Hope Church Pretier Park, which yeah. will also be a community church. And then we started Hope Church Mongu in Western Zambia. And the Zambia project there in Zambia is a church planting movement. And we have started um, 103 churches already. I'm sure by now that number has grown again. And then also ARC, which we oversee, the Association of Related Churches, is a church planting movement. And churches are being planted all the time across Southern Africa. Our mission is to reach people that are far from God and help them become fully devoted followers of Jesus. What is a fully devoted follower of Jesus? A fully devoted follower of Jesus is somebody who knows God, who has a relationship with God. It is somebody who has found freedom. And it's somebody who's discovered their purpose. And next week at step three, we are going to talk about discovering your purpose. And lastly, a devoted follower of Jesus is somebody who is making a difference. Our slogan here at Hope Church is, well done. So So others others may may live. live. (laughs) We love this. It says it all. It's not about us. It's about God and other people. For us, a mature believer is not necessarily somebody that served God for 20 years or who knows the Bible, who comes to church every Sunday. It really is somebody who knows it's not about them. It is all about God and other people. We were still living in Zambia when we watched this movie called The Guardian with Ashton Kusher and Kevin Costner in. And it was so good. They were lifesavers. They were not Christians at all. It's not a Christian movie, but they they were lifesavers and they were saving people's lives. They were willing to die for people and they weren't even Christians. And their slogan was, so others may live. So we were like, ooh, if we have a church one day. Definitely. That's our slogan. So others may live. So we have a great vision. But you know what? It is really our culture that empowers our vision. Vision won't just happen. It really is our culture that empowers that. And what is culture? Culture, in short, is really the behavior of people. So culture is that uh, intangible, what is that? How does everyone know how to behave the same way? (laughs) Why is everyone at Hope Church smiling? Why is everyone at Hope Church uh, serving? Why do they all seem to do things so well? You see, Culture won't just happen. Culture is something that we need to teach and Be intentional about. clarify and then inspect. <laughs> and it, it really is our values that determines our culture. Yeah. So we love our values. Um, we have 10 values and I'm going to go through, through them so you know all of them. The first one is every person is valuable to God. Every person is valuable to God and therefore to us. We love this value. Mm. I can see you really like this value as well. Team, we is better than me. We try not to say I a lot. (laughs) And even like, for instance, 
Claire Cooper, who runs our kitchen. Yeah, at Hope Church, praise God for her and the whole kitchen team. But she's never going to say, my kitchen. No, it is our kitchen. And Zaghnesha, who runs our kids' church, she's never going to say, my classrooms. No, it is our classrooms, because we a team. Jesus chose to work in team, and so do we. Servant leadership. We help others achieve their destinies in God. And didn't Jesus just set the most incredible example for us of what it looks like to be a servant leader? Generosity. We believe we are blessed to be a blessing. Yeah. Authenticity. Reflecting Christ in everyday life. Just be yourself. <laughs> um, I think after best advice I can give you is just be yourself. You know, God's created us uniquely, specifically the way he wants us to be. And he is going to help me become the person he's made me to be. He's going to help you. He's committed to help you become who he's created you to be. But when we try and be someone else, he's not going to help us. <laughs> and that's a scary thought because we need God's help. So let's just relax and just be who we are. Family, we believe that every, every single person needs a sense of belonging at church and at home. And honor, we believe in the next generation and we value the wisdom and guidance of those who have gone yes. before us. And excellence, we just love doing things well because it honors God and it inspires people. Excellence is not perfection, but it is progress. It is doing the best with what we've got. Relevance, being culturally relevant while remaining doctrinally pure. pure. And fun, fun opens the heart and refreshes the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes we will say to new people at Hope Church, what do you love most about our church? And they will say, you know what? We just really love that things are being done so well here. And we're like, that's our value of excellence. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we will speak to a person and they will say, you know what? When you come to Hope Church, you just feel special. And we're like, you know what? That's our value of every person is valuable to God. Them. So our values are crucial to what we do here yeah, at Hope absolutely. Church. Somebody once said that culture eats vision for breakfast. Oh, so, wow. we can, <laughs> so we can have this amazing, amazing vision, mm. but if our culture isn't healthy, then we're never going to achieve it. And our, our values are what determine our culture. When we live out our values mm. of family, of, of fun, of everybody being valuable to God, of giving our best to God, that's so, so, so important. And you'll notice that that's exactly who we are. And, um, and we believe it's, it's a God-honoring yeah. culture. Do you like our values? I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things we believe. We have a statement of belief. Yes. And this is included in your manual for step two. So we can't encourage you enough to go through that. But we just want to mention some of them. And the first one is the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is completely true and it's the authority on which we base our faith and our conduct and our doctrine. Then the Trinity. We believe in one God who exists in three distinct persons. Yeah. Jesus is the Son of God and He came to die for our sins and He rose again. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in all truth and He empowers us for effective ministry. Salvation. We spoke about salvation in step one and how Jesus died for our sins and how we need to receive him as our Lord and yeah, our Savior. So good. And then water baptism we also spoke about in step one. But we believe that God's words is believe and be baptized. Then communion. I love communion. We have communion here at Hope Church once a month. At our small groups, we take communion. We do it to remember what Jesus did for us at the cross. We as a family take communion every, every single night, night mm. at home. You may wonder how on earth do you get that right. <laughs> well, sometimes it's just five minutes, sometimes just ten minutes, sometimes longer. Yeah. But we always treat that as a special Time moment. for our family, yeah. Just to stop and reflect and thank God for what He's done for us. It changes everything. Yes. And then growing relationship. It's very important to us that we all grow in our relationship with Jesus, where we become more like him. It's called a sanctification. You know, I'm not the same person I was five years ago. And praise God, I won't be the same person I'm now. Five years from now, mm -hmm. I would change. And Paul says, praise God for that. <laughs> but I actually um, saw 
someone who was at school with me a few years ago. And after chatting to this girl for a while, she said to me, oh my word, you have changed. <laughs> I said, oh, what do you mean? She's like, you are so much nicer. And I thought to myself, what was I like, you know? <laughs> but praise God, I'm becoming a nicer that person. That is what God does in us. That yeah. is what he does in us. It's brilliant. And so in the manual, uh, there's a little bit more detail about some of the statements, some of the, the issues, the things that, that might be important mm. for you to understand about what we believe, it's in particular about marriage, about sexual purity. Um, and I would encourage you to go and read that. Yeah. But you know, these are things that we believe as a church, but we do have a saying as well here that you can belong before you believe and before you behave. In other words, we're always open. Mm. Feel free, even if you don't believe what we believe or 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 live the way that we think Christians should live. So you can come and be, and be a part of our church. We encourage you to come and just participate. But as you get more and more involved in our church, then what you believe and your behavior becomes more and more important. It is very important to us that all our volunteers are believers who are in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. But absolutely anyone Believer, non-believer can come to our church on a Sunday yes. and be part of what God's doing here. Absolutely. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to take some time just to pray, pray for you. But I want to encourage you again. You know, the church is God's plan. It's not man's invention, it's God's invention. Mm -hmm. The Bible actually tells us in the book of Ephesians that this is part of God's eternal plan. Right. And so when you commit to the church, when you commit to building the church, you're not building an institution, you're building God's dream. God's wow. dream for humanity. God's dream to see real life change takes, takes place. The Bible tells us that God looks. He looks at the earth and he sees the pain. He sees the struggles. He sees what people go through. Mm -hmm. He sees the loud cries and he sees the silent cries. Yeah. He sees it all and he's moved with compassion. And God's answer to bring hope and mm -hmm. healing is the church. And so when you're bringing, when you're coming, when you're serving, when you're giving your best to build the church, you're giving people hope giving people an opportunity to encounter Jesus, their personal lives to be changed. If their life gets changed, guess what? Their family's life yeah. gets changed. If their family's life gets changed, gets changed, wow. and enough families get changed, guess what? The community gets changed. And so God's got a dream for your life. He's got a dream for your family. He's got a dream for our communities. God's got a dream for George. He's got a dream for Southern Africa. He's got a dream for Africa. And the way that that dream is going to become a reality is when the church really is the way that God wants it to be, bringing life and hope to people that are far from Him. So thank you so much mm. for taking this step, joining us, and building the army that's really going to bring this to pass. But I'm going to pray. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had just to talk and share about the church that you want us to be, God. And I just pray, Lord, we pray for all of us, Lord Jesus, that we'll continue just to give our absolute best towards your dream, Jesus. Lord, that we'll give our absolute best as towards, towards being the type of people that actually build something that brings so much glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we already can't wait to see you next week for step three of discovery. Discover your purpose.